ahead of time what we're headed for. Okay, so what we have to deal with then is the notion of history and theories and planning. Um, and I'd like to put this in the context of, of us just thinking about why planners do what they do. Why do we think that the kind of work that we do and the way we do it, the processes that we use, why do we think those will be successful? Well, those we think that'll be successful because we have two things going for us. One is a sense of history. Um, the uh, the uh, notion of planners have been doing this for 150 years, uh, varying uh, iterations of it for 150 years, we've built up experience and we learn from that experience and that's what history teaches us. Um, and the second part is we think carefully about what that, that experience is. And that essentially is what theory is. It's uh, an effort to make sense of our practice and to give us guidance and uh, ways forward in terms of how best to think about uh, how to do planning. So planning history and planning theory are fundamentally linked to each other uh, in a way that has to do with the understanding of how we do practice. So what we're gonna be covering today is this relationship between history and theory, the kind of emergence in, in historic terms of, of planning as a field of utopianism, which is closely associated with it, then the codification of that into planning practice, and then the emergence in the 1950s, really at the, uh, not until the 1950s, of kind of theories that are based on trying to make sense of what this experience tells us. And what, that includes the notion of rational planning, uh, the, the challenges and responses to rational planning, and then alternatives to that, uh, communicative planning, political action, and pragmatism, which are theoretical responses to the uh, strengths of rational planning, but also its weaknesses. Uh, we will then go back a little bit into more history of around new federalism, um, and then finally conclude with a, a, a brief uh, discussion of core values and planning, and then some supplemental resources that might help you prepare for the exam. Um, and so in this context, uh, we look at the history and theory of planning I just look for insights into the current planning practice. Uh, planning is a, an applied discipline. It emerges out of social conditions. As those social conditions and practices change, so does planning, right? And it's codified as a professional activity, originally uh, transmitted by practitioners to apprenticeships. And then since the 19, really 30s and 40s, uh, the emergence of university-based education uh, for professional practice. Um, the theories provide insight into these processes and, uh, and in that context, uh, the theories uh, learn and from and also inform practice. So we can think about planning itself as a set of four uh, kind of uh, related uh, concepts. So one is, is that planning is a, per, a pervasive human activity. It's future oriented and it's around decision making, right? So it has goals. So it, uh, you, it, it, in order to plan for something, you have to know what you're gonna plan for. It's based on knowledge. You have to have a way of thinking about how these goals can be achieved and what future conditions might look like. And it's uh, brought together in a process, which we call planning, that links those goals and knowledge to actions. So unlike social sciences, planning is in fact action oriented and therefore knowledge and goals are, are determined in order to in fact uh, um, uh, promote actions that then change the nature of cities and the opportunity sets and other kinds of things that residents in those cities face. Um, and so, the functions of planning is, first of all, to improve efficiency of outcomes. The action is largely optimizing. So traffic engineering, for instance, is a good example of efficiency-oriented outcomes. Uh, we also have social welfare-oriented outcomes where we seek to balance interests. And we engage questions of justice. We have another goal, which is to widen the range of choices available to residents to investors, to property owners who are in a particular community. Um, and and it, in order to 
uh, provide more opportunity to those individuals. That often gets us into questions of equity, but at the very least, it gets us into questions of visions and how, in fact, we can increase options. Uh, we finally, in terms of goals, seek to enrich civic engagement and governance. We intervene in ways that make local governments, regional governments work better to expand opportunity understanding in the community itself. And then we have these functions. We assess, we analyze, we engage with communities and stakeholders, we envision, we design, we synthesize, we put things together, we implement. So those are the functions. And the question is, how, what kinds of actions are needed in the middle? to link the goals that we have with the functions itself. And obviously, in any particular situation, the goals are going to be, it's not going to be just generally efficiency or social welfare or something like that. We're going to have much more specific goals about how these things, uh, what in fact we're looking for, uh, and therefore the actions will also be much more specific as well as the processes, right? Um, and so, Planning theory itself emerges from this applied dis discipline. It focuses on problem solving. Um, and the early planning theories, if you look at them, make very little distinction between goals, knowledge, and planning processes. Um, they were utopian visions. They were essentially said, this is the world we're trying to create, and here is my way of creating it, in a way that, as we will see, could not be tested as to the efficacy of those particular strategies, but we're quite clear about what they thought ought to come out if in fact those strategies were applied. Uh, and, and again, it's not until the 50s and 60s that coherent theories uh, that uh, seek to uh, link interest values uh, and uh, you know, processes to actions emerge, and they seek to do it by rationalizing the interests and activities uh, and and they, they start using social science as a broader interpretive lens. So let's go through this and, and say what we mean by theory, because theories mean many different things. So there Professor first of Elliot, all- Professor Elliot, I'm sorry, may I interrupt for just a moment? Your slides sure. don't seem to be advancing on the screen. So I'm not sure if you're advancing through them yet or just giving us an overview yet. No, no, I've gone through six or okay. seven different slides. So yeah, they're um, not, it's still just now they're advancing. Yes. Well, now I've gone out of the, um, what do you see? <laughs> Cause we I can't see, see we're seeing types of theories is what's on our screen right now. Just that. Uh, yes, sir. That is the slide. And then we also see the slides, the, the previous slides on the left-hand side. It looks like the upcoming okay. slide is emergence of yeah, planning. So this this is not, I can't actually show it in this format. This is just the general. But if I, if I make it increase, now what do you see? Do you see types of theories? We do, yes. If I, do you see normative theories under that? Uh, yes, types of theories, normative theories, that entire slide, we see that entire slide. Okay, well, hopefully, so I, I did have slides for the ones before it, but- um, And I will just back. say, we are going to make the slides available to all of the participants afterwards. They'll be posted along with this video on the GPA website. Okay. Thank so you. So as I said, there, there are types and, and uh, you know, if you can, if, if, if it stuck, sticks again, just jump in and tell me because I'm using slides pretty rapidly and if they're not changing, they should be. Um, Okay, so uh, you know, we I said that we have to think about theories more carefully because there are different types of theories. So one type of theory has to do with what we call normative theories. Uh, they have to do with the the ends to which we are doing planning. What are our goals, right? These are theories of the public good, social justice, utilitarian notions of of human rights and other forms of right. Um, the second is what we call disciplinary theories. And this should have changed. Did it change? Do you now see disciplinary theories? So I think the thing, Professor Elliott, is that we are looking at PowerPoint. So we're seeing your entire presentation at once, whereas I think you might be in presenter mode where you're able to go through your slides and show the animation. But what we're seeing is just a screen of PowerPoint itself 
with all of your slides on the left hand of the screen and then the slide in full on the right side of the screen. Does that make Does sense? Does anybody know how to fix this? Because I've never so seen this before. What I would recommend doing is looking at um, in your Zoom window, when you're able to share your screen, when you click on share screen, do you have an option of which screen you can share with us? Like, can you see a little preview of the window that you will share with the, with the group? Um, let me... Let me do this. Uh, let me see if I, uh, if because uh, it seemed like I have two. Now, what you're seeing right now is the slideshow without, um, you know, when I click that, I can show display, um, but it only gives me two options, swap presenter view and slide view and duplicate slideshow. I would say maybe duplicate slideshow, maybe. That's, I had that on that. So right now it uh, says type okay. series and that's all it shows. Okay. Okay. But that's, yep. that's not what you're seeing, right? Nope. That, so we are just seeing the PowerPoint file itself as if you were, you know, edit. It, it's the view we would see if you were editing your PowerPoint slide. Okay. So one thing you could do since we're having a trouble, if you wouldn't mind, I know we'll miss out on your animations, but you could just, click through your slides in PowerPoint, and that might be a way at least we can follow you with your content. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, um, I know it's not as pretty, but thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, okay, so now you see types of theories, right? And that slide? Yes, and we see normative, disciplinary, as well as procedural process. We see all that information. Yeah, so, um, so, so the second type is disciplinary theories, right? The, so we have normative theories, we have disciplinary theories. The disciplinary theories are really theories about how things work. Like we have communities, we have regions, how do they work? Um, and how do we assess existing and uh, you know future and project future conditions? I mean, so we have to know <laughs> something about, for instance, demographic analysis or any number of other types, GIS, any number of other things. We look at economics, geography, environmental science, all of those kinds of science, social sciences and physical sciences to help us understand these disciplines. And then finally, we have this notion of procedural process. Um, the, that was the uh, variance. Who's somebody uh, not on mic? Um, so we have these procedural process theories of how planners act. They come from decision theory, political science, negotiation theory, public participation. And together, the goals plus the knowledge, right, uh, through planning leads to action. And the what we're going to focus on in this uh, is the notion of planning, which is the, the blues uh, arrow area. So in this, so I guess the question is now, when I click this, you, st you see the emergence of planning and utopianism, right? Yes. Okay. So in this, uh, we have to start with where, where does planning come from? And we have a number of, of uh, a kind of beginnings that are in the colonial period. Um, most of those uh, early planning efforts really focus on urban design and street systems. We have the grid and park system from Philadelphia. We have the, the radiocentric from Annapolis and then later from Washington, DC. We have the Ward Park system from Savannah. And uh, there are, you know, William Penn, uh, LaFont, Oglethorpe are all associated with this. Um, the Savannah, of course, is uh, the one that we probably know best. It's also quite unique in um, not just US, but also global cities to create a modular system like they did, like uh, Oglethorpe did in Savannah, that can then simply be replicated in which within each module, there's a hierarchy around a park of spaces, and then there is a hierarchy of streets on how these things get connected. Um, that has been quite resilient in, uh, over time, even after the advent of the automobile, um, and, um, and continues to, in fact, work quite well. Um, and so 
We also have other levels of early planning. Uh, we have national planning uh, efforts that largely were about taking land um, which had not been held as property before and the federal government when, for instance, it bought the Louisiana Purchase, essentially uh, claimed all of the land and then allocated it. And they used planning or, uh, ordinances to allocate this land. Um, the ordinance of 1785, which is the first public land ordinance in 1825, they did start developing infrastructure for westward uh, migration. Uh, that is the Erie Canal, the 1862 Homestead and Morals Act. Um, all of those are examples of national ordinances around land and land use. And then at the local level in the late 1800s, you start to see nascent kinds of planning um, in, for instance, what's called the old New York tenement housing law, which dealt with the overcrowding that was occurring in New York City, particularly amongst immigrant populations. Um, in this, we can also look at other examples, which are, for instance, the socially engineered communities. So we can look at Riverside, Illinois, Pullman, Illinois, which had uh, uh, kind of modeled communities that, um, that were built on uh, this notion that cities had become corrupt and dangerous and uh, disease-filled and um, crime-filled. And the idea that you could design suburbs that, uh, that were much more orderly, much more physically organized, but also had some pretty strong social conditions attached to it. Uh, George Pullman, for instance, so Pullman was the manufacturer of the Pullman railroad cars, um, and the industrial town produced those railroad cars, and the workers lived there, um, but uh, you know, provided quite significantly better housing than workers could have gotten in, in Chicago. Um, but also had conditions like no alcohol and other kinds of conditions that were associated with living there that uh, you know were largely developed by Pullman and in terms of uh, what uh, was seen as a viable community. Um, so this this is going to be it's not going to show up nearly as well as it does when I when you show sequences because each of these pictures comes in layers. Um, it's just, but uh, let me just uh, kind of summarize this, that we, um, once we start getting into the 1850s and 60s, we can start talking about movements that lead to planning and emerge out of planning. So the first of these is the parks movement. And we're going to, in fact, talk about each of these movements separately. So I'm not going to do that now, but the parks movement and then the sanitary reform and public health movement that responded to the diseases that were rampant in the city. Um, the, the third one is, uh, is essential. Let me, let me just move to this one because it's a little clearer. The third one is the settlement house movement, uh, which responded to immigrants moving into cities. We then have the city beautiful movement. We then have the city efficient movement and cutting across the last of these uh, is the Garden City movement. So we're going to cover each of these movements fairly briefly um, as the kind of uh, the foundations from which planning uh, emerges. Um, so the Parks movement uh, is the most, uh, the, the people best known uh, is Olmsted. I mean, there are other, in other cities, there was uh, Cleveland, there was Elliott and Baxter in Boston that created, but the Olmsted was the nationally the best known firm doing this. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted uh, creates the design of Central Park, uh, building that park well before the city of New York grows up around it. Um, and you have uh, in, Cle in Minneapolis and then in, in, in Boston, the, the quite extensive regional park system that gets developed. Uh, the idea behind this is uh, the notion that parks, in fact, uh, civilized people. They provided uh, uh, you know, uh, places of nature and repose in nature. And uh, you know, given that cities were incredibly dense and um, they, they provided kind of a relief for that. 
And, uh, and so this kind of civilizing feature of parks is, uh, is a motivator for the creation of these parks. Uh, many of them are actually designed, like if you look at cemeteries from that time, they also have this kind of rich experience of, of uh, you know, being park-like in, in their structure. Um, the second movement is the public health and sanitary reform movement. Uh, these take on a couple of different formats. Um, the San Francisco was the first, for instance, to have a modern land use zoning is that where it's uh, forbade slaughterhouses in um, many of the districts. Um, in Chicago, if you read The Jungle or something like that, had similar kinds of problems. Um, in 1867, 1879, New York City has the tenement house controls, the first tenement house controls. And then in 1879, Memphis uh, faces what many cities were facing. 60% uh, of the city left Memphis in the summer of 1879 due to the presence of yellow fever. So the city's population dropped to 40%. Of those who remained, 80% got sick. 25% of those died. So these conditions are emerging in cities partially because of the overcrowding, partially because of the water systems and the way water is being managed, the sewage and um, other kinds of things. And they lead to reforms around both the physical infrastructure of cities to manage these problems and to try to manage the overcrowding conditions that tended to spread these kinds of diseases. So this ultimately grows into, uh, at least at the beginning, what we would call planning, but ultimately then grows into a separate profession, which is public health. And it's interesting that those separate out in the early 1900s and then come back to some degree around issues of healthy places uh, in, in the last two decades. Um, the next movement was the settlement house and reform movement. Um, this is, uh, these are efforts by reformers to provide uh, social supports to immigrants. Um, uh, it, it's built on a rise in social consciousness. We have a number of books that are quite uh, well remembered from that period. There was a book in 1888, Looking Backwards by Bellamy, who promoted city and national planning by, by in essence, science fiction that Put, placed itself in 1988 and then looked backwards over the last hundred years before that and showed how planning made the cities so much better. Um, the uh, Jacob Rees is a good example of what we call muckraking of uh, uh, either literature or photography. Um, and, uh, you know, so the book How the Other Half Lives and the book Children of the Poor uh, focused on slum and poverty. The picture to the left is one of those pictures uh, by Reese um, that, that demonstrated and made public what uh, most people could not see. Uh, Jane Addams starts the Hull House in Chicago the, and the Settlement House movement uh, that's related to that, uh, where the provision of not just simple services, but education and a whole wide range of services is provided to uh, residents of the area around Hull House. A similar uh, a kind of uh, uh, um, organization or nonprofit was started in New York City by uh, Mary Simkovich in the Greenwich uh, House in 1902. Um, interestingly, Simkovich also was one of the principal organizers for the first National Conference on City Planning. Um, what we'll see is that in 1906, the first conference, um, the social dimensions of planning and the physical dimensions of planning were both uh, heavily present, but we'll get back to that. Uh, I just want to put this slide up, um, the idea that uh, the good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. That's Jane Addams uh, in her book, 20 Years at Hull House. And, and discusses the kind of motivation for why you might have uh, an organization nonprofit like that. Um, so the next movement is the City Beautiful movement. And at the City Beautiful movement, just like the Parks movement, City Beautiful movement is essentially about physical buildings, physical environments, right? 
And the idea is that in this case, instead of necessarily building parks, you're gonna build cities that are in fact beautiful by their design and therefore uplift people who live in it. Um, so uh, you have the Columbian Exposition uh, where the white city, these pictures are of, in Chicago of the white city, it was uh, both Burnham and Olmsted, uh, Burnham being a, uh, a, a father of planning uh, who worked out of Chicago, uh, Olmsted we already talked about. Um, and then you have the, in 1902, the Macmillan plan for Washington DC, uh, which was an update of LaFont's plan Again, Burnham and Olmsted, except this is Olmsted Jr. Uh, 1906, San Francisco plan. So you start to see these emergence of civic spaces that are designed to uh, uplift people uh, and often draw from European and classical European examples rather than indigenous and American ex examples. Uh, and, and then you also get the Chicago plan. Uh, it's the first metropolitan regional plan. It's done by Burnham again. A Chicago plan, um, I believe, is still taught in, Ch in Chicago public schools. That's uh, the only plan that I know of that was uh, brought into school systems. And what I mean by school systems, I mean, uh, you know, uh, elementary schools and high schools. Uh, it, it, as to the, the how this plan actually helped create Chicago in the way that it is. Uh, the most famous quote from Burnham is uh, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans, remembering that a noble logical diagram once recorded will never die, but long after we have gone will be a living thing, asserting itself with ever growing insistency. Let your catchword be order and your beacon beauty. This captures the idea of the city beautiful movement, right? That you make these, these bold visions and those bold visions work because other people see their boldness and see their, their usefulness and they build according to it because of that. So it's the idea that plans uh, are, uh, have effect, not because they're regulatory, or, but because they're desirable. Um, the, at this, uh, during this period of time, the early 1900s, we start to see a larger a political movement emerge, and it's called the progressive movement. Um, and the progressive movement uh, was a reform movement in the United States. Um, it was a political and economic reaction against the emergence of corporate monopolies uh, and the influence of, of ward bosses like Tammany Hall. Um, and uh, so it had a two different, and really three different dimensions, because there's also a rural dimension to this. Uh, that were coming together around the way that our economy and our, uh, in particular, our, the economy was working, but also how our political systems were working. Um, and uh, it, in terms of its uh, relationship to planning, it's really the ward bosses, the effort to control uh, uh, ward bosses like Tammany Hall, that led to this idea that um, you know, that what you needed was the emergence of a corporate model of management. Um, the, the assessment was is that the cities didn't work as, as efficiently as they should because power was dispersed amongst many elected officials. And that dispersal of power meant that, um, that uh, ward bosses could have significant control. I'm not gonna get into how and why that is true um, but you saw this kind of, of uh, uh, boss system, board system emerging as a result of that. And what the elites largely wanted was a more business oriented uh, local government. And that was partially related to the fact that they, the elites were moving to streetcar suburbs. So they physically were no longer living in the cities, which they were still trying to politically control. Um, and there was an effort at this time to rationalize and professionalize city governance. They do. Uh, somebody is not they muted. If you are not muted, please mute yourself. Oh. Um, oh. So where were you? Where were you? Whoever is talking can hear you. I think it's John Ross. 
John Ross, could you mute yourself? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so uh, the idea was to rationalize and professionalize city governance uh, by creating a civil service, by depoliticizing cities, and planning emerges as a profession in that context in a different way than it had been when it was just part of social movements. So in this context, um, we get to this question of utopianism. And, um, and uh, we're going to talk about three utopian uh, kind of movements during this period of time. The notion of utopianism is that there is a vision of the good society and it's created through intentional communities. And it's created by conscious thought and by planning um, in, in a way that planners would be quite familiar with, right? Um, that, uh, you know, planners proposed kind of sweeping changes. These were not small ideas. These were big ideas. And they affected physical, social, and economic systems to enhance human progress while being in equality. Uh, so the plans themselves were kind of imaginative visions rooted in moral th philosophy. They were focused on the ends, the moral ends, not particularly on the pragmatic means. And so examples of that would be the Garden City movement. So uh, Ebenezer Howard, uh, and if you've not read the Garden City movement or something about it, it's a very interesting idea. Um, in which he was in England. Um, London had all these problems. If you've, you know, if you've read any literature from the 1850s, uh, you know that the major themes of the time in cities were how, uh, how dirty they were, how much poverty they were, and things like that. And the idea that he proposed is these small um, uh, cities that would, would essentially uh, be duplicated over a region. So each city would only have about 20,000 people. Um, it, they would be shaped in his thinking as, as, uh, as basically circles, um, where the center activities is the garden and the parks and the, uh, the uh, you know, museums and churches and things like that, where everybody could get to fairly easily. Um, you would have working class and rich uh, right next to each other. The rich would have a grand avenue. The working class would essentially live around that. Uh, and all the employment would be on the outer ring where there would be a railroad so to service all of that. And rather than letting this grow, what if you once this was filled, you would simply duplicate it in another place to produce a city that also had much of the same structure. And then you would use railroads to link those things up. This is before the advent of the car. Uh, the cars were just starting at this time and it, it wasn't clear that they would have much impact on this. Um, it included social reform and economic self-sufficiency. It included community ownership of land uh, with public revenues based on rents rather than taxes. Uh, it had agricultural uh, belts uh, that would integrate town and country um, right around it. And, and so it had this kind of full vision. Now, we might note that Garden City uh, has in greatly influenced American cities, but all of the social arrangements, all the economic arrangements have been stripped out. And the only thing that has remained is ideas of this linkage between uh, garden and city, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, in Atlanta, for instance, um, Ansley Park would be a great example of a, of, a, of a neighborhood built along some of these Inman Park, other things around these ideas, but with all of the economic and social conditions stripped out and not at the city scale, but only at the level of an individual neighborhood. Um, so we can see also examples of the Garden City that have been, um, uh, you know, that are that essentially have been built either in the United States or in England. Um, the first two are in England, the Greenbelt, Maryland, the picture on the right was built during the depression um, and it was a, built as a public cooperative community. It looks a lot like the original model, but it doesn't have any industry in it. And therefore it's much more like a, a, a bedroom suburb than it is like a garden city as Howard mentioned it. So 
the next visionary that we talk about is uh, Le Corbusier. Um, Le Corbusier was a founding member of our Congress International uh, d'Architecture Moderne. And, um, and so the CIA, and he basically suggested um, that he applied Taylorists. So Taylor was a uh, researcher who in economic development issues uh, was the, the kind of progenitor of uh, the factory, the notion of, of specialized work and, and getting people to do repetitive work. And he did time studies about how long things took in order to uh, manufacture a car, for instance. Um, and the idea was to take those rationalist ideas and apply them to social urban order. Um, what you see behind you is a model of uh, one of his plans. It may not be obvious to, to all of you, but some of you may recognize that this is actually Paris. And what he's done is he's eliminated the heart of Paris and replaced it with these towers. And so the idea was to wipe away all of the old and to replace it with these, uh, these uh, forms that concentrated people into towers and then used gardens to, to connect them. We clearly see this uh, uh, carrying over into our public housing pro uh, 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 projects in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, and, um, and so uh, this idea of a new architecture, the idea that it will is a men's step in evolution, the idea that people will in fact evolve into higher forms because they are living in better architecture and planning urban design. Uh, we, we burn our bridges and break with the past. So that's again, an idea of utopianism that it's about leaving the past behind, just thinking about what, how to go forward. Um, and the third visionary would be Frank Lloyd Wright. We tend to see him as an architect, uh, and he certainly is best known for that, but he also had designs around what we would essentially call, um, the, well, he called broad acre city. Um, and it was a response to Le Corbusier's radiant city. Uh, and rather than creating these dense industrial cities, what he, proposed is to cover the entire United States connecting with highways and therefore row, I mean, uh, cars, um, a, a, a interlinked uh, towns of 10,000, each city embedded in nature with its own cultural and educational centers and an economy of self-sufficiency without land rents and landlords, profits and bureaucracies. It was all private ownership. Uh, very easily see how this leads to thinking about suburbs and it's uh, suburbs. Uh, but in his particular case, he didn't see the sense of central cities. Again, he talks in terms of humanity being modified by spiritual changes and physical advantage by these kinds of designs, by connecting to nature in that kind of way. So these are visionaries. But these visions, um, all of them are shortchanged. Um, you can look at all three of them, and they're all they are they all inform the kinds of cities that we got we created, but they inform them in ways that were not at all consistent with the original vision. Um, and that's partially because these movements, these utopian movements, are, can, are really utopian. Uh, they reject historic precedent and propose substantially new arrangements but they fail because the social and economic proposals are largely ignored. Um, they provide intellectual rationale for suburbanization, urban highways, dense urban uh, public housing, segregation by use, urban renewal. Those are the things that emerge out of them, all of which are gonna prove problematic. Um, and then ultimately these goals are actually challenged because by just focusing in on the utopian vision, and ignoring all of the things that contextual issues that lead up to it, um, you basically has no process for revision and learning. And planning needs to be able to revise and adapt and learn. And these utopian visions did not provide that. So how does this then create a profession? Um, what we have is, first of all, we can, and I'm, I'm not gonna go through all these details because of how long it took us to, to get my, uh, my presentation to actually work, um, but it's, but you'll get these and you, and the, 
there's a, a kind of set of actions that took place in the early 1900s that lead to the codification of planning as a profession. Um, the most important of these would probably be the, the National Conference on City Planning in 1909. As I mentioned, uh, this was organized by both the, the social determinant uh, uh, branch of planning and the physical determinant branch of planning together, um, largely at the behest of the social determinants. And I might note by the time they have the second city planning conference, that the physical determinants have essentially captured the conference. And the social determinants, the people who think that you improve people's lives by making their social conditions best, as opposed to the physical determinants who say, you make people's lives better by giving them good physical systems, good housing, good parks, uh, good urban design. Um, it's this latter group that essentially uh, emerges as dominant in the planning profession. And for the next, really until the 1960s, so the next 50 years is dominated by the physical uh, kind of concerns of planning. Um, and so we can go, continue to go, this idea of efficient cities um, uh, is significant. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of things. One is the Standard Zoning Enabling Act was uh, proposed by the US Department of Commerce. So it emerges out of the notion, the idea of enterprise and commerce as a supporter of this idea of using planning. Um, you also have in 1926, Euclid versus Ambler Realtor Company, which is of course the most uh, famous of the Supreme Court decisions that had to do with planning. Um, if we continue to go forward in 1920s, uh, Robert Moses emerges in New York City. And if you've not read The Power Broker, it's a fascinating read. Uh, it talks about Robert Moses as a planner, and he essentially replaces Burnham as the leading American planner. And his attitude, unlike Burnham, who's very uh, kind of visionary, uh, Moses is also visionary, but he basically says things like, if the ends don't justify the means, then what the hell does, right? Um, he's basically uh, really good at getting things implemented. Uh, Moses, if, uh, you know, if you if you, uh, if you go forward, uh, the fights in New York City um, are you know, around planning are largely about the visions that Moses have and the way that uh, 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 highways were being cut into uh, communities. We'll get back to that. Uh, in 1928, you also have the Standard City Planning Enabling Act, also again issued by the US Department of Commerce. Um, okay, so obviously, Depression comes next. By 1929, we're already in the Depression. Uh, depression changes planning in a couple of significant ways. One is it moves planning out of a strictly local perspective and, be, and kind of emergent regional perspective into a national and kind of national urban and urbanization policies. It's a number of, of conditions that are, uh, you know, programs that are established under uh, FDR's efforts uh, that uh, really are about uh, planning at a much larger scale. You have the emergence of regionalism, such as the Tennessee Valley Authority. There are several others like this. Um, and planning education moves from an apprentice-based to university-based with the emergence in, um, first in at the Harvard uh, of a planning-related uh, courses, and then the development of a degree program uh, for planning. Um, the focus is on physical planning. Uh, the purpose of planning by the AIP, um, which is APA's predecessor, uh, is the unified development of urban communities and their regions as expressed through the determination of comprehensive arrangements of land use and land occupancy and the regulation thereof. So it's a, it's a narrower vision about what planning could be than existed in the 1910s and that will come back to exist in the 1960s and 70s. Um, the other, we, we also, during uh, right after the Depression, right after World War II, um, we have these mass migrations, and this is overlapping, but there are three migrations that are of importance. Uh, the first of these was the in dark blue, the African-American migration in World War I and World War II to Northern and Western cities. 
where industrial activity uh, opportunities existed. Uh, the second was the the migration of northern whites to Rust Belt and Sun Belt, uh, from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belts, due to the emergence of air conditioning and the changing ways that cities could incorporate uh, people comfortably. And the third migration is uh, related to all those small little crosses there, um, where you have inner city whites moving to suburbs uh, in the 1960s and 70s and proceeding from then on out. Um, and so this, this kind of emptying out of cities of particularly working class and, and lower middle class whites and the bifurcation of cities between, at, at least for those cities that ma maintained the rich, the, between those who are rich and those who are poor. And then some cities, of course, are kind of losing the rich as well and ending up with uh, a predominantly poor uh, 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 residents and the, all of the difficulties associated with that. Um, we have Levittown at this time. Uh, Levittown is an effort to, in fact, apply mass production to the construction of housing. Um, and William Levitt was on the head of, uh, it was on the cover of Time magazine uh, for his efforts. What you see on the left is all of the slabs for the construction of all of those houses. They just went through and just built slab after slab after slab, and then they'll go through and frame them up one after another, and then the electricians will come in, all in a kind of factory-related way. Urban renewal during this time becomes quite significant. There's a number of different acts associated with urban renewal that create it, um, but uh, again, I'm going to leave this for your own reading. Um, and this is tied to the emergence of modernism. Now, modernism came out of Le Corbusier's ideas about um, making uh, form follow function and the uh, aesthetics of, uh, of form that rejected uh, kind of historic precedent and, um, and employed materials and technology in a quote unquote honest way, which meant you could see all the structures in the buildings themselves and it tended to create these plans that were uh, kind of style-free plans with universal spaces that were very easy to adapt. Turns out that this is in fact highly desirable for corporations. Um, and as so as businesses increasingly became uh, corporations as opposed to small individual businesses, they needed bigger buildings and they needed uh, uh, places that they could easily adapt and with very large workforces. And this kind of emergence of modernism feeds that. And so we can see an example of that. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is a typical urban renewal during this period where uh, at the bottom left, you see the bank that's being demolished because it's old and in the way. Um, and then uh, you see what gets built, which is Lancaster Square um, and the kind of dramatic redevelopment of a one time era area of obsolescence into a show place of design with dramatic firsts, right? And then you see uh, within five years that one of those buildings is actually torn down because the design simply wasn't working and creates a space for this large open plaza. Um, and so there's a kind of experimentation going on around modernism in cities, and we still see lots of remnants of that in the cities that we, uh, you know, in, in like Atlanta or cities all across the United States. Um, they tended to produce uh, uh, large open spaces that were very lightly used except for major events, like if you won a, you know, basketball championship or something like that. But generally speaking, um, the, this picture uh, in the middle uh, shows how much these spaces were actually used. So in this, um, we, can, uh, we can now change our attention to this, uh, the emergence of rational planning as a, uh, the idea of comprehensive, synoptic, comprehensive rational planning. And um, we can, uh, which emerges out in the 50s and 60s, as a way of thinking about planning process, that we're not just designers, we're not just visionaries, we have a process for making sense of the world, we use social science in that process to make sense of the world, and then we suggest actions 
to meet goals that are defined by political agents and by communities. Uh, and we assess the likelihood of achieving our goals uh, using social science. Um, so it's a structured process of decision making. It seeks to maximize desired goals by careful consideration of potential consequences of alternatives, which are the means, right? Um, and the planner is seen as an expert capable of designing for and coping with complex urban conditions with specialized knowledge, techniques, and technologies. So the process looks something like this. Uh, and you've all seen variations of this, right? Uh, you start with this notion of interests and values and that communities have, or at least politicians have, community leaders have, they identify goals. So you start with goals. You identify, identify alternatives that can help you meet those goals. You evaluate the consequences of each alternative. The notion, of course, is that you would have all the alternatives, which of course never could possibly take place. And so there's some limited set of, of alternatives, but in theory, all of them. And you evaluate all of them in terms of their consequences. You choose the alternative that maximizes the goals. Um, in some way, makes a lot of sense, right? You, you, you decide what you want. You figure out uh, the, the varying ways that you might get it. You figure out which one works best. You choose it. And then you implement. And then the idea is you evaluate the outcomes that you would, in fact, achieve the goals. And that evaluation leads to uh, increases in scientific knowledge and in better methods and analytic techniques, which then feed back to uh, better goal setting and alternative identification in the future. So that's the idea. It's an optimization idea, a scientific technical process. Um, and uh, it comes out of a number of sources. So one of them was Rexford Tugwell, who had been working uh, with uh, in the uh, FDR's administration um, and had uh, seen science, the application of science to social goals at a national level and was bringing that to education. Uh, so University of Chicago. Hello? Yes. Was that that? OK, I'm taking that was accidental. Um, the was taking um, the University of Chicago uh, started a planning program. It only lasted eight years. It's a, a pretty amazing thing that it had as much impact as it did because it reshaped the way we were talking about planning. Uh, in addition to Tugwell, you had Meyerson and Banfield who wrote Politics, Planning and the Public Interest. Again, a case study of housing, uh, public housing in Chicago. Um, and an argument for rational planning uh, in, a, in the context of uh, political decision-making and planning. Um, you have other rational, rational theorists, uh, Davidoff and Reiner uh, in 1963, uh, a choice theory of planning, um, proposed a similar kind of model. Uh, Faludi in 1973 tries to in fact uh, bring uh, the idea of rational planning up to date. Um, and so these are efforts to, in fact, rationalize planning. Um, it's based on notions of, of increasing capacity to do analysis and to model things. Um, and so urban models, we can see the history of urban models. Uh, I might note that generally these models did not work particularly well. They did not, in fact, they couldn't even replicate what actually happened you know, up to that point. Um, let alone project what would happen in the future, but they intellectually created uh, a, a framework for trying to make sense of how urban environments, urban cities actually grow. Um, and the emphasis on rationality comes from a sense of optimism that, uh, that the sciences, the power of the sciences to resolve social problems. Part of that came out of the depression and World War II experience with planning, which had pulled this, the the country back from uh, a terrible depression. And then um, at the emergence of uh, computers, this is a picture of one of the very early computers. That computer could probably do one, one, one thousandth or one, one millionth as much as your, your phone can. Um, but nonetheless, at the time, it was an incredible machine. Um, and so all of that, and then 
you know, of course, uh, in the 1960s, the race to the moon, um, where, where we didn't even have functioning rockets at the beginning of it, um, and uh, but uh, Kennedy committed us to getting to the moon by the end of the decade, and we did, right? Again, applying science uh, to that. So we have this optimism that, of course, does not exist nearly as strongly today. So there are challenges and responses to this idea of rational planning. Um, that they take on three different characters. So one of them is this idea that problems are not easy to define, uh, urban problems. They're not really subject to optimization. They are what we call wicked problems. The second is that knowledge is limited. It's uh, We don't really have the capacity uh, to do comprehensive rational planning. And the third set of, of critiques are around that interests are plural. The public interest in rational planning is almost always oversimplified. And usually what that means is that the public interest is thought of as the interest of the elite within the community, uh, that the civic leaders define what the public interest is as opposed to the community itself. But when you go into the community, there's much more divergence in interest and rational planning has trouble, comprehensive rational planning has trouble managing that. Um, so first, this idea of wicked problems. Um, this is a, from an article by Riddle and Weber, uh, The D Dilemmas in a General Theory of Planning. Uh, they were faculty members at uh, Berkeley, University of uh, California at Berkeley. And they basically looked at the characteristics of the problems we face when we try to uh, deal with planning. Um, that uh, we have problems that change their nature. What constitutes affordable housing, for instance, is, is as you as you actually try to solve that problem, the nature of affordable housing changes. Uh, they evolve. Uh, they're not the same as intractable problems, which are just difficult to solve, but rather that the that they're part of the social condition, and as such, they are not just problems. They're also uh, embedded in very large urban systems. And so we have this, uh, a number of specific characteristics, but largely what it means is that in these problems, like if we think affordable housing, we think about how to get people access to things. We think about environmental integrity or economic uh, well-being. Um, they're hard to formulate. They, they're contextualized. What constitutes good policy in some place might not be good policy in another. They are multidisciplinary. They don't, you can't just look at civil engineering to figure out transportation. Uh, and they are embedded in organizations. And all of those things make them very hard to optimize in the way that rational planning seeks to do. So the second critique is this idea that knowledge is limited. Uh, there's impediments to comprehensiveness. Uh, we have cognitive limits, we have resource limits, we don't have time to go and analyze everything, we don't have the data to go and analyze everything. And also, uh, ultimately, synoptic rationality, comprehensive rationality is an infinite regress. You can always come up with more alternatives. And so there was an effort to, in fact, uh, think about how one would make rational decisions in a context where there were limits, right? And there were two sets of theories. One of them is called incrementalism and the other is called mixed scanning that emerge at this time. Charles Lindblom in the science of muddling through in a whole series of articles that come out after that, basically arguing that planning is less scientific and comprehensive and more politically interactive and experiential. Argues that the way we get things done is by taking smaller steps and checking to see if we're going in the right direction rather than envisioning a whole new uh, system. Um, and uh, so uh, Lindblom's incrementalism trusts social experimentation over theory. Uh, and you act uh, incrementally through repetitive attacks, uh, looking for direction. Um, there is going to be critiques of this. And the critiques are largely that this may tend to reinforce the status quo. Uh, uh, the next one is the notion of mixed scanning. What Etzioni did um, is to suggest that we could combine some elements of incrementalism and some elements of rationalism by doing what we call mixed scanning. And the idea is, is 
that when you look overall at the problem, um, there are going to be certain places of opportunity which are clearly better than a lot of other potential opportunities. So we do an analysis from from perspective of wide angle, looking looking at the whole picture, and then determining where we should in fact examine more closely. And then once we've identified the few places of most uh, likely opportunity, we look much more deeply using kind of rational planning around those kinds of things to make those kinds of comparisons. So that we use the wide angle to sort of eliminate 90% of the alternatives that really aren't going to be particularly good and then focus in on the, the ones that show the most opportunity. Um, and so uh, that is the idea of uh, limits to rationality and the responses. Uh, the next set was related to interests are plural. Uh, and this is related to community power and social justice. In 1960s, of course, the, we have the emergence of many, many different movements. Uh, the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement, all of these movements in which each one of them uh, arguing that the, that the elite in society at that time were not taking into consideration the range of human experience that they needed to, and uh, they, that they had excluded systematically women, uh, you know, African-Americans, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who cared about the environment, but but in more particularly the environment itself from their decision making processes and that that was inappropriate. And this leads to a planning response of both advocacy planning and radical planning. Um, and so in this, we start to see other sources. Uh, so for instance, the urban villager, uh, Herbert Gans's book, which examines the West End in, uh, in Boston and argues that it was not a slum in the way that we normally just simply defined a slum at that time, but rather a vibrant community. And that the destruction of it was a destruction of a vibrant community, not an economic wasteland. Um, had enormous impact on planning. Uh, the other one that um, almost everybody knows about is Jane Jacobs, uh, The Life and Death of Great American Cities. It is Jane Jacobs uh, and other people who lived in, in Manhattan that fought with Robert Moses over a proposed cross Manhattan arterial that is shown here. And obviously, since that road was never built, uh, Jane Jacobs and, and the local residents eventually won that fight. Um, so advocacy planning, Paul Davidoff, remember he's the one that uh, was the rational planner, uh, essentially takes notions of rational planning and says, well, you can't apply it to a community as a whole, a city as a whole, um, but you can go into local communities, neighborhoods that have shared interests and then use rational planning efforts to help individuals in those communities make sense of their options. And then the general notion was, is then the planner who does this, who develops the plan with the community, goes into the city as a whole and argues for the plan within their community when the larger issues of citywide planning are in fact developed. So the, the planner becomes the advocate for that neighborhood. Um, the advocacy model obviously pulls from the idea of legal systems um, and uh, uh, where the interest groups propose their own goals, policies, and plans and the planners advocate for them on the part of their clients. Uh, and it, there, this is tied to a special responsibility towards marginalized interests. There is at this time also uh, radical planning that emerges um, that is a much more uh, systemic critique of the political and economic power structures in the United States in this case, but also in Europe uh, around um, how to in fact engage with uh, with the bureaucracies of cities, the decision-making processes of cities and things like that. Um, so what was the big response to all of this? Um, th these fights are going on, these ideas are emerging, uh, they pr are providing different uh, kind of uh, uh, foci in the 60s and 70s, um, but out of that, they're the biggest ideas to emerge and the ones that have continued to affect planning most significantly are these three. The idea of planning is fundamentally a communicatively rational. I'll talk about what that means. 
that it's based on political action and that and there's a, another set of theories that it's pragmatic that it is contextualized it responds to conditions uh, that you find in cities itself and so we we look at the the movements during the 60s and 70s and realize how big they were, how much impact they had. Um, and the national response to that was uh, the Great Society program uh, in the Emergence Civil Rights Act, the Housing and Urban De De Development, uh, the Model Cities program, uh, and under Nixon, the emergence of the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Environmental Policy Act and the other environmental clean water, clean air acts that change uh, the, the ways that we engage around these kinds of uh, critiques. Um, I'm gonna skip the postmodern one and go to a couple of others. And yeah, now I'm not gonna skip that. Um, there are also a kind of set of uh, critiques that are going on at this time. Uh, this idea that knowledge is not objective, and we can see what the, where that has brought us. Um, but in the 1950s, facts were considered to be facts and shared widely. Uh, that's challenged increasingly, and the, the challenges go back to these ideas that marginalized voices have been systematically excluded from the knowledge creation, and therefore the knowledge itself is not objective but socially constructed. And that um, that you know planning has a special responsibility to deal with this issue uh, in terms of emancipating for not just uh, the uh, the role of of uh, residents to have voice, but also for them to understand the situation from their own perspective. Uh, you also see uh, this idea of transactive planning from John Friedman. Uh, the again idea of of face to face of, with people affected by planning decisions uh, and an emphasis on processes of personal and organizational development, not just functional objectives. Um, so citizen participation takes on a whole new uh, meaning at this period of time, and you see Sherry Arnstein's The Ladder of Citizen Participation. Um, this is, by the way, the second most quoted article, planning article, uh, in that uh, uh, in the American Planning Association, if you look at um, all of the citations and planning journals, this is the second most. The first was the Riddle and Weber article on wicked problems. Um, and, and then more systematically, the emergence of uh, what we call communicative reasoning. So uh, Jürgen uh, Habermas uh, is, a, uh, is with the the kind of uh, Frankfurt School in, in Germany um, that proposes that really the way you get true understanding and true community engagement is with four conditions. The, the communication has to be mutually comprehensive. Uh, they have to be able to under, be, understand each other. They have to have a sense of values that are understood. There has to be truth and truth seeking by truth making and truth seeking on both sides. And there has to be some system of trust. And that language is, uh, is the vehicle by which this happens and action is what emerges from that. So as a general idea that is then uh, turned into by people like uh, John Forrester or Patsy Healy or Judith Innes, uh, the idea that planning is fundamentally a communicative act uh, that's centered on social learning and culture building that the things that we we make plans for um, are, are products of that uh, social learning and culture building, like the cities we designed, the, the, uh, the economic systems of how they work, the, the kind of diversity of, of opportunity in a particular place. Um, but that central to this is this idea that, uh, that really we need communicative rationality. Uh, and the emphasis on this is that First of all, there's a notion that means cannot be isolated from identification of valued ends. Means and ends are not separate. They are interactive. The people do not understand what they want until they can imagine it in a more concrete way, until they can actually see how they could get it. And that the idea of, of getting people to just simply tell you what they want, and then experts go off and figure out the best way to do it, 
fundamentally is flawed and that uh, an interactive process in which we, we revisit the idea of what those desired ends are as we explore the means to get them um, that can happen in a communicative process. The emphasis on transparency, inclusiveness, and truth thinking. Uh, and you get practitioners, people who are, this is uh, Larry Suskin's model, but uh, Larry Suskin was, uh, oh, you know, while an academic at MIT, was very much a practitioner. And he starts building these models for how one would move through a planning process, drawing on uh, many of the authors that we've been talking about. Um, and uh, as a way of informing different stages of how one engaged stakeholders, what's the role of organizations in all of this? How do you implement things like that? Um, so in this context, there's a number, a couple of other things that I just want to, in the last few minutes, uh, mention. And that is, is that, of course, the planning in, in the context of the United States is, has shifted. And it's away from those programs that, like the Great Society program, which built national presence in local communities. And it's uh, starting in the Reagan administration, a move towards what we call new federalism, this idea that states and localities should have their own choices and that in as much as the federal government is involved in things like planning, it's largely to provide funding to those localities uh, to do their own plans. Um, and so you see this kind of uh, emergence and different community development uh, block grants and, um, and other kinds of spending to create uh, large, instead of categorical grants, uh, which are very specific, uh, looking at a larger, what we call block grants, which allows for much more flexibility at the local level. Um, and therefore funding decisions about planning get pushed back down largely to local and regional communities, much less at the federal level than it was in the 60s, 70s. Um, and you see that in, uh, in relationship to a whole series of other innovations that are going on, uh, some of which have to do with uh, the idea of uh, fair house, fair share housing, uh, the emergence of Hope 6 um, in order to deal with severely distressed public housing, uh, the idea of enterprise zones and empowerment zones that use tax credits, uh, tax incentives to uh, promote uh, redevelopment of cities, um, and a few other uh, efforts in, in terms of professionalizing planning. Uh, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning, which is the, you know, the, the academic parallel to the APA, was established in 1980. Um, and uh, the Planning Accreditation Board was started in 89, both of which are really about uh, uh, defining what constitutes good practice in the planning profession. Um, and you also see this idea of pragmatism or contingency theory uh, in which they start to you know, think much more carefully about planning as a professional act that occurs within a political community and what that means, the political and social interactions mean in terms of decision-making and in terms of learning. So the last section we have is this idea that uh, there are core values in planning that are, are um, since none of your other um, uh, prep courses will deal with this, uh, what does that mean? Um, so planning is fundamentally forward-looking. It links knowledge to action through goals. So there, it's value-driven. The notions of sustainability and resilience have become dominant uh, kind of ideas about what those values should be. And it seeks to produce healthy and prosperous communities. It's embedded in community diversity and engagement. So this issues of diversity and democratic engagement, the issues of transparency and social justice are all significant. And I'll close with this idea of supplemental uh, resources. I could ask this question. I'll ask the question if anybody wants to jump in. Um, so all the following are known for involvement in organizational approaches to citizen participation, except who? Anybody want to take a cut at this? Well, if you don't know the answer to this, that's a good reason to go and think about your history and uh, your theory before taking the exam. 
because this is the kind of question that you're going to get asked. Um, and uh, in this particular case, the answer is B. Uh, these are resources. Uh, I've tried to create two very simple resources for you. I think if, in fact, you understand what's in these two books, you'll probably do fine on the uh, planning and theory, uh, the history and theories parts of the exam. Uh, one of them is Planning Theory for Practitioners. It's published by the American Planning Association Press, came out in 2002. The other is a history of city planning uh, by Mel Scott. Um, and so those two together will probably serve you well. Um, and I'm going to stop at that point. You have, there's some other things in here if you're really bold and are interested in other books. Uh, but I would uh, put most of my attention on uh, the, these two resources. So I'm going to stop sharing if I can figure out how to do this. Uh, stop sharing. And if there are any questions, I know we covered a huge amount very rapidly and the original confusion did not help. Um, but if you have questions, now's the time to ask them. Thank you, Professor Elliott. That was a rapid fire, and I do apologize for our challenges at the beginning, but I think everybody was uh, appreciated all of the information that you did share. So does anybody have any questions for Professor Elliott well, I again? The award to, I must give the award to Ellie because she, in the chat, she put the right answer. So congratulations. Oh, good. Congratulations, <laughs> <you>. Ellie. <laughs> I will just repeat. School. Yeah, <laughs> I will repeat for those who did maybe didn't hear, we are, this has been recorded and this uh, recording along with the PowerPoint presentation will be added to the GPA website um, in the next couple of days. So um, if you so are interested in- can, um, Given the problems we had with the, um, the, the PowerPoint, mm -hmm. uh, if you, do you have access to last year's? Because we it do. covered, mm -hmm. we do have it covered the material, so and it did not have this problem. So maybe that would be better to put up than okay. this one. We can take a look at it. We can also edit the the file a little bit as well. So, okay. um, whichever. Okay, thank you. If you are Hi, registered I, for an additional or interested in additional sessions, those uh, the schedule will be posted on the website, and I believe we emailed about it as well. Christina did, and then you will receive a Zoom link the day before, just like you did for this one. And um, we will add in the missing one as soon as we get that speaker confirmed. Did we have a question from someone? It wasn't a question as much as, I noticed that there were some differences in the PowerPoint. So if you can post this one, regardless of the issues we had at the beginning, we would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. So, so I need to email that to you, Beth Ann. Is yes, that... sir. We'll, we'll, we can chat about that offline and we'll get that from you. Okay. So just send me a request and I'll just attach it and send it back to you. Sounds great. I hope everyone has a great evening and thank you for joining us today. Have a good night. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much. Much. Thanks, Beth. Appreciate good night. you all. Yep. Thank Take you. Take care.